All right, how about this then? How are you managing downside risk? So when we think about managing downside risk, uh, to us, the main thing that, that there's a few things that come to my mind. And one is you want to make sure that knowledge is power. So you're just, you're researching everything you can to understand your businesses and have a really good understanding of them. Um, because knowledge of your businesses will help alone manage that downside risk. Number two is the price that you pay. Um, not only do we put pencil to paper to try and figure out what the valuation is of everything that we're buying to make sure that if we buy it at this price, will it still work out? So for example, we bought Amazon before this drop, but I'm confident that Amazon will still work out in the long run from the price that we originally paid. We had no guarantee that it would drop this much. Had we known, of course, we would have loved to have waited. But um, as long as we bought in at a price that, that is not a permanent loss of capital, uh, it, it'll still work out and, and we believe provide a, a healthy rate of return. But addition, in addition to just um, buying things at a good price, uh, we also are fishing in high quality waters. And as Elliot already mentioned tonight, when you're constantly fishing in high quality waters, a lot of studies corroborate, corroborate the assertion that high quality companies tend to be perpetually undervalued relative to their dominance. And so it's almost like by fishing in those waters, you're already likely to be buying into businesses um, that'll provide healthy rates of return. Um, and that's just simply, I think, because of that behavioral that people want to get rich quick. You saw it, they were buying into crypto and um, Tesla or just all these things they're buying into to get quick returns. And then boom, this year, there's some of these businesses, they're down 80, 90%. Um, and so, whereas, uh, you know, you own a bunch of high quality things, I think you're going to watch these businesses really start to dig in as they continue to uh, plow forward with their cash flows. So how do we manage downside risk? I think what it really comes down to, it's what you buy and what you pay for it. And what we buy is we're, we're, we're trying to mitigate risk by owning the most dominant business models in the world. And I just think that a lot of things go well for you over the long run when you're invested alongside the most dominant global champions in the world. Yeah. And I, I would just make a couple extra points. So, you know, we try to focus on categories that are, that are growing at least as fast as GDP as well. Like, like we've mentioned, because the thing with that is even if there's an unexpected competitor that comes up, um, you, you can, if, if you have a business with a great economic model in an industry that's growing, that has this great network, then it can still increase its prices, even if the other business is succeeding. And so a great example would be something like eBay uh, versus, uh, versus Amazon, where Amazon has definitely eaten eBay's lunch in a lot of ways over time, yet eBay has still grown its, grown its users and, uh, and grown its stock price um, over, over the last 10 years and then you know, over the last 20 years, et cetera. Um, and Just to get the stats on that, uh, Elliot, really fast, the stats. eBay grew, so in 2010, when you guys might think eBay's losing its relevance over time, they had 92 million users in 2010. By 2021, they had 159 million users. And the gross merchandise volume that went through their platform, it went from 53 billion in 2010 to over 100 billion. And the stock over that time went from 10 to 45. So in an 11-year period, the stock, you, you still made four and a half times your money in a business that was essentially in decline or, or dying relative to say the dominance of Amazon. And then, so, um, so there's enough room, there's enough room for more than one player to, to still eke out a great return for its investors. Yeah. And then I would also just say that instead of just owning one business, we try to own a collection of them that's diversified across category, industry, geography. Um, again, because you can't predict the future, it's good to try to own uh, as, as, you know, many great businesses as you can kind of find and understand. And then, um, and then I would say you also, um, a lot of our businesses have increased their value to customers far faster than they've increased their prices. So we try to be in businesses uh, where there's a lot of untapped current pricing power. So a great example would be something like Moody's where they charge, you know, seven to eight basis points per year to rate debt. Yet the value that they create is 30 to 50 basis points. 
so they could raise their prices from eight basis points to nine basis points, which is, you know, over a 10% uh, increase while still barely affecting the value proposition for uh, the companies that use them. Then also our businesses, you know, um, have a lot of excess costs that they can wring out because they're spending on unrelated growth, you know, unrelated growth initiatives. So that's another er area of resilience. Uh, then also they have conservative balance sheets and they produce cash across cycles, which allows them to uh, marshal resources to take advantage of the unexpected things that happen. For example, if you have an unprofitable growth company that its stock is down 80 to 90%, there's nothing you can do about that, even if it is undervalued because it's unprofitable. So it doesn't have any cash to buy back stock or anything like that. Whereas our businesses can take advantage of that and increase all of our ownership in that business at a very attractive price, creating accretive value over time. They can also buy distressed competitors or put the pedal to the metal and, uh, and grow market share while other competitors are reeling competitively. So those are just a couple other ways that we try to sort of manage the long-term downside risk of our businesses. All the stocks we've mentioned should not be considered a recommendation to buy or sell the stock. Consult your financial advisor for your specific situation. You can also request from YCG a list of all the securities that we've recommended over the last 12 months. Thanks for watching. Check out our other videos and we'll see you next time.